I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die All right, let's go. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Greg Laughlin, Professor of Astronomy at Yale University. I'm not certain whether or not Dr. Laughlin has spoken for Mount Tam Astronomy before, but he has spoken for Wonderfest before. In fact, Greg spoke at the very first Wonderfest when he was a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley and when Wonderfest produced the first Bay Area Festival of Science. That's where it got its name. That was back in 1998. Professor Laughlin earned his PhD in astronomy and astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz, and then did postdoctoral research at the University of Michigan and at Cal, go Bears. Greg then worked for NASA as a planetary scientist at Ames Research Center before returning to the UC Santa Cruz astronomy and astrophysics department, ultimately becoming a full professor. Now at Yale, Professor Laughlin studies fundamental astrophysics, including tonight's subject, predictability. On earth and out there, way out there, he'll be talking about predictability of, of the serious manifestations closer at home and again, way out there. Please welcome Dr. Greg Laughlin. Thank you, Tucker. That was a, a wonderful and kind introduction. It's great to be back among friends 22 years, 23 years after yeah. um, the original Wonderfest. And um, it's too bad that can't be up on Mount Tam uh, tonight. I'm sure it's beautiful. I'm sure it's, sure it's exciting and wonderful. So I'll try to uh, make this a talk about ideas rather than um, spectacular images. Um, it's hard to compete over Zoom on anything other than ideas. So what I'll do now is I'll share my screen and uh, share, share my slides that I wanted to uh, talk about tonight. Um, so now, just want to verify that you guys are all seeing this beautiful piece of clockwork. This is a picture uh, that I took at the Paris Observatory showing one of the old orreries that were used to uh, predict the positions of the planets uh, through, through time. And, you know, it's when you give an astronomy talk on Zoom, it just never works to try to awe everybody with the images because the bandwidth is low and you guys have a very, very uh, kind of high expectation. So I'm not gonna try to compete with spectacular uh, images of the cosmos, but rather I'll show pictures mostly that I, I, I took myself. And this right here is not a particularly exciting picture. The main um, that you can two wires uh, down in the lower right hand corner. This is taken from our uh, front steps. You can see the, the crescent moon. And then also up in the upper left hand corner, you can see a very small dot. This was taken with uh, effectively a cell phone camera. So the resolution isn't very good. And when you zoom in um, to the pixel scale, uh, this is the, the, the planet Venus in the evening sky. And it, it always is kind of interesting, you know, during that time when the sun has gone down and when the sky is darkening, if, if uh, the planets are out, it's this kind of interesting perspective to think of the fact that you're looking with your own eyes at a, a world that is nearly the size of, of our own. Um, Venus is, of course, tremendously different than Earth, yet its overall size and scope is, is, is quite similar. And over human time scale, it you know, makes this interesting trajectory through the sky. And that, of course, has uh, fascinated many cultures over, over the years. The Maya were completely obsessed with understanding where Venus was going from night to night. And the sort of advance that really broke things open, of course, was Isaac Newton's understanding of the law of gravity. Isaac Newton um, recognized that mass attracts mass with uh, inverse square law of force, the one over R squared law of force. 
And that deep realization really opened up an understanding of the solar system. So this is a, a woodcut from uh, Newton's Principia, and it shows a schematic diagram that gives a um, intuitive understanding of how an orbit works. Uh, here, what, what Newton is showing is a uh, cannonball that is imagined to be launched from a very, very high mountain with larger and larger um, velocities. And uh, as the velocity gets larger and larger, the, the range gets larger. And so with this velocity, um, you land at point D and then at point E, if you shoot it faster, point F, there's a particular uh, ballistic trajectory in which you go all the way halfway around the earth before landing. And then there's finally that magic speed, the orbital speed, the Keplerian orbital velocity, where if an object is launched at the Keplerian orbital velocity, then it will fall endlessly in a circle around the earth. And so this of course is the, the concept of the, the orbit, uh, which is due to gravitational attraction. And when there's one source of mass, namely the earth, if we imagine that the Earth's mass is all concentrated in the center, then the orbit is perfectly solvable. So the sort of most simple version, of course, is the circular orbit. But Newton also showed that if the velocity isn't quite right, then the orbit will be an ellipse. And so he was able to understand the motion of the planets around the sun. Uh, he was able to give a full explanation of the laws that Kepler had, had found. And so the, the laws that, that Newton um, was able to derive for the Keplerian orbit, as I said, depends on having just a single central mass and one body falling in that central mass. So the earth falling around the sun gives rise to a perfect elliptical trajectory. But if there's more than one body, uh, Newton understood that things would become much more complicated. Newton understood the predictability of an orbit, which is perfect if you have a Keplerian ellipse, was no longer perfect if uh, there's more than one body in play. I'm having actually trouble advancing my slide for some reason. Let me escape out of this or stop the share. Sorry about this. Experiencing a technical difficulty. Let me try resharing my slides. Are you guys still hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay. Thanks. There's, you know, something about Zoom is that you have to expect the unexpected. And this is apropos to a talk about predictability. I was unable to predict what was going to happen with my slides. So let me try. Uh, sharing them again. And uh, what is in this slide, which uh, was what I was trying to advance to, are three situations in which uh, a star is accompanied by more than one uh, planet. So I just play these animations. They were supposed to loop, but they stopped looping here. This one is, is, is looping. This is an extrasolar planetary system. This is a system of two planets that orbits the star HD 128311. This is a star quite a bit like the sun in the solar neighborhood. And uh, what you can see is that the presence of these two planets gives rise to a system which is much sort of trickier to understand than the orbits in our own solar system. Because the two planets in HD 128311 are pulling on each other gravitationally, as well as being attracted to their central star, they're affecting each other's orbits in a complicated and sort of magnificent way. Their orbits are actually crossing over each other every few hundred years. This is sort of a fast forward movie of what the system is doing over hundreds of years. And you can see that this is a sort of a, a trickier situation to understand and analyze. Let me just try this animation. This is another nearby star with three planetary, three planetary companions. And you can see as well that the orbits are not perfect closed ellipses. They're sort of wandering around. They're a little bit like a wheel that is not well balanced. Uh, here's another system 
Gleazy876, which also is quite complicated, but displays this sort of interesting clockwork regularity. Gleazy876, the two outer planets have a two to one period ratio. And so they are sort of acting like a pendulum with respect to each other as they orbit their parent star. And all of these are just three examples of a whole myriad of phenomena that can occur when you have three or more bodies trying to orbit each other. And Isaac Newton, yeah, Tucker. Very good, quick question. Would it be risky for you to go to slideshow mode just to make your images a bit larger? Oh yeah, sorry about that. I, I forgot to try that. Thank you. Um, so, um, Isaac Newton knew that the um, planets would be pulling on each other, and he knew that the orbits would not be perfect Keplerian ellipses if there was more than one body. And he tried very hard to get a general solution, a general way of predicting what would happen if there's more than two bodies in the system. And Isaac Newton is, as you know, sort of regarded as one of the great geniuses of all time. And he wasn't able to get a solution. He sort of gave up in dramatic fashion. And he had this quote from a letter of his to a, a clergyman friend, um, where he wrote that to consider simultaneously all of these causes of motion and to define these motions by exact laws, admitting of easy calculation exceeds, if I'm not mistaken, the force of any human mind. So, so Newton has sort of thrown down the gauntlet and has made the statement that the problem of predicting the future when more than one body is involved is inherently extremely difficult. Um, sort of a superhuman task is required. And so sort of statement of the problem was immensely attractive to mathematicians who came later, right? Because if you can solve a problem that exceeds the force of any human mind, then you've demonstrated in some sense, a superhuman intellect. And so I see that, you know, Tucker, my slideshow just is not advanced when I go into the main thing. So I think I'm going to have to do the lower resolution version here, unfortunately. Um, let me reshare that. Now I'm looking for the, sorry about this. That's all right. I, I'm actually an Apple fan too. I don't use Keynote, but I'm, I'm sorry if that's the problem. Yeah, I've, I've taught literally hundreds of pandemic classes and I've seen all the different um, things that can happen, but this particular glitch is one that I'm fully unfamiliar with, so I apologize for that. So I think what you see now on my slide is the uh, main slide and then this uh, sort of slideshow mode on the left. So I think that I'm going to need to go with that in order to not have to break out of the, of the, the presentation every single slide. Um, so I was talking about how uh, Isaac Newton basically said that the three body problem was insoluble. And so that led to intense efforts through the 1700s to understand the general problem of three or more bodies that are self gravitating and the specific highly relevant problem of the motion of the planets in the solar system. And in 1777, right around the time of the beginning of the American Revolution, um, Pierre Simon de Laplace came up with a solution for the motions of the planets in the solar system that was so good that it fit the observations of that time absolutely perfectly. So uh, the ability to measure the positions of the planets was good to a fraction of an arc second. And the predictions that Laplace could make for where the planets would be 
were of order an arc second in, in a quality over time scales ranging into the decades. So they had old observations dating back to the 1600s and they were constantly making new observations. And Laplace's solution, uh, which in particular explained this curious motion between Jupiter and Saturn uh, that had mystified uh, Isaac Newton, his solution of this was this extraordinary intellectual accomplishment. And Laplace was not one to sort of be overly modest. He was not somebody who suffered from false modesty. And uh, he took this solution and sort of ran it to its logical conclusion. Um, so there's this, this very interesting quote from his book on probabilities, which was published during the end of his life in the early 1800s. And this draws on his fantastic success with predicting the motions of the planets in the solar system. And he, he took this idea of predictability and he extended it to the entire universe. So he came up with this idea that if you know the conditions, the initial conditions, the positions and the velocities of all the particles that make up the universe, then if you apply the solution in the same way that he applied the solution to the motion of the planets, then you can know the future for all time. And so this idea, it's called Laplacian determinism, is quite a remarkable idea because it removes, for instance, the free will, it makes free will an illusion. And it posits that the simple conditions that occur right now will determine the entire fate of the universe. And he's effectively saying that predictability is perfect. And so this Laplacian determinism is very much a bedrock principle for the science of the 1800s. And even as it was being applied in sort of all through science, for instance, there was efforts to um, make a social physics where the behavior of humans was uh, to be predicted with analytic equations. There were efforts to do that. And it was thought that that would be possible if just the right equations could be had. But even while those ideas were spreading throughout sort of the intellectual firmament, um, problems with Laplace's solution were starting to become apparent. Um, this is a picture of a, another Frenchman, also a Frenchman who uh, did not lack for self-confidence and who uh, gladly wore these various medals that he received from the the, the uh, various scientific societies of Europe. This is the discoverer of Neptune, Urbain Alverier. And in addition to um, discovering Neptune by looking at the perturbations of Uranus's orbit and predicting where the unseen planet would be, uh, Louverier was also very interested in the motion of all the planets in the solar system. And as uh, the 1800s progressed, the ability to do high resolution, um, high quality observations got better and better. Um, some of you may be re uh, familiar with like Joseph Fraunhofer's uh, refracting telescopes were extraordinary advances in um, observing technology that, that came about in the early 1800s. And um, because of that, the ability to measure the planetary positions got better and better and better. And what was realized that by the 1850s or so that the Laplace's effectively calculations were, were incomplete. And that as time accumulated and as observations became more and more uh, finely gradated, it was clear that Laplace's solution wasn't, wasn't correct. Um, and a huge efforts went into refining Laplace's solution to try to get you know, a version that really was correct and really would allow for a prediction of the future into the indefinite um, forward years. Uh, but no one could do it. And the situation actually became um, serious enough that King Oscar II of Sweden 
offered a large prize for the demonstration that the solar system uh, motions could be predicted. And in particular, a demonstration that the solar system would, would be stable for all time. By stable, what we mean is that the orbits will oscillate in a bounded way around their current configuration and that you won't have dramatic events like one planet crashing into another or things like that. Uh, clearly, it's something that's of substantial interest to know whether the planets will be stable or not. And um, so King Oscar II uh, had this prize in a, in a contest where uh, lots of mathematicians entered and tried to demonstrate that the solar system would be predictable for large periods of time. And interestingly, um, the winner of the contest was Henry Poincaré. Uh, one of the great mathematicians of the sort of late 1800s and early 1900s. And Poincaré uh, demonstrated something that was remarkable and quite simple. Namely, he showed that let alone eight planets, but two planets would execute motion that would be entirely unpredictable over long periods of time. This was a result that was in complete uh, contradiction to what Laplace had been arguing. Poincaré showed that even two planets orbiting a star will exhibit over long periods of time complete unpredictability. If you wait long enough, you will not be able to say with any certainty where the planets will be in their orbits or even whether their orbits will exist at all in their current form. So this was this uh, quite an alarming um, demonstration. And the fact that it holds even for uh, two planets, for two planets orbiting a star for three bodies is, is remarkable. And it ties into this very interesting paper that appeared in German um, in 1913. Uh, so, this now it's like Saturday night. It's uh, Zoom talk. It's low bandwidth. The slides are only partially on the slide. And then I'm showing this uh, paper from 1913, which is written in German, right? And so it doesn't, I, we're probably like the, 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 the number of Zoom participants is probably falling just extremely rapidly right now. And, and uh, Tucker is probably wondering, uh, like, well, why did we hire this guy no, no, to give the talk? They're staying for the car we give away at the end. Oh, right, for the car. That's right, right uh, for the correct prediction of which door it's behind. Um, in any case, this, this paper is, is sort of remarkable because what it describes is a very simple problem. The problem is, is if you have three planets with a mass of three and four and five, and you place them at rest, the vertices of the three, four, five right triangle, uh, there was a, a mathematician who in 1893 declared that the solution to this problem uh, was fully predictable and that it was periodic. Uh, this idea was is that if you put these three bodies in this particular configuration, then you can predict what will happen for all time. And the idea is, is that the planets will do stuff and they'll come back to exactly where they started and then they'll do it again and they'll repeat that infinitely. It's not clear why this mathematician declared that that would happen and it wasn't clear whether it would happen. And so this paper is an effort to make the calculation. It's basically an effort to prove that Poincaré was incorrect in this very, very special case, which is this very simple configuration of three bodies. And so the, the paper is in German. It talks about where the, the planets start off and then it gets quite boring. So this is the third page of the paper. It's, it's even less interesting than reading a phone book. Uh, with a phone book, you can kind of like, you know, get a sense of who lives where, and like what the distribution of names is. It's, the names are interesting. Here, this particular paper is just columns of numbers. And what the columns of numbers represent are an effort to calculate, predict where the three planets will go after they've been started with this particular initial condition. 
and the paper goes on for several pages like this, and then it it comes to an unsatisfying end. Uh, and the problem of trying to predict what happened has failed. What they're saying is that there's basically no indication that the, that the bodies have a predictable regular solution. Um, what the paper calculated, what those, those numbers, those columns of numbers show is the first beginnings of the interaction. Remember that the orbit of one planet around the star is very simple, but when you add three bodies, the orbit starts to become complicated. And so in 1913, using a, effectively an adding machine and cranking hand done calculations, they were able to march the bodies through part of their motion. Um, they start at the corners of this three, four, five right triangle, and then their gravity causes them to fall in towards each other. And what they calculated was that bodies four and five come close to each other and have a close encounter. And during that time, it's very tricky to calculate exactly where they are and how fast they're moving. So you can see that the calculation steps slow down for body three while body four and five are having this encounter. And then body three falls through the system and bodies four and five have a second encounter. And this is where they got tired of trying to figure out what was going on with the adding machine. This was as far as they were able to get in 1913. Something that's also sort of interesting is that if you look at the paper, um, it has one author, Dr. Carl Barrow. But if you look at the acknowledgements in this paper, the very end, it says that most of the calculations were done by uh, Mr. Sigurd Christensen, who was a graduate student. And so one advance that astronomy has made in the last century is now that if the graduate student does all the work, then the graduate student gets to be first author on the paper. Uh, but in this case, that wasn't true over 100 years ago. It's, it's now possible to uh, calculate the full motion of what happens. And it turns out that the bodies don't come back exactly to where they started. Um, I'm not going to run through this entire computer simulation, but it shows the sort of intricate motion that the three bodies engage in as time goes on. And over here on the left is a visualization of all the motions that they, that they do. And what happens is that body three ends up getting thrown out of the system. Bodies four and five are locked in a binary orbit. They leave in one direction and body three leaves in the other. And so this system, it turns out, is predictable, but it displays this interesting property in that the tiniest change in the initial condition completely changes the character of the emotion if you wait long enough. So moving the body just a tiny, tiny fraction of its initial distance is enough to totally, totally change the situation. Now, this is now a very familiar idea to us. Um, this is, of course, the, the well-known butterfly effect. And um, Henry Poincaré, in studying the motions of the planets and trying to understand whether the solar system is predictable, he realized in a deep mathematical sense that the universe, which is governed by um, differential equations, nonlinear differential equations, is subject to this sense of dependence on initial conditions. And it's something that you can never make go away. And what it means is that predictability for an extraordinarily complex system is impossible over long periods of time. Um, this is now really well studied and really under, well understood, um, especially starting in the 1960s the idea of um, chaotic motion of the weather system became understood. 
And so the butterfly effect specifically refers to the idea that the simple flap of a butterfly's wings changes the air currents enough so that over a time scale of roughly three weeks, uh, the entire Earth's weather system patterns are completely different. And so everything that's happening everywhere determines what happens three weeks down the line. Um, the Earth is a classic example of a nonlinear, <laughs> non-predictable in the strictest sense uh, system. But what's interesting about the Earth weather system is that it doesn't go completely off the rails. Uh, we know that it's going to be hot in the Midwest in the summer. We know it's going to be cold in northern Canada in the winter. And there is the sort of baseline <laughs> predict predictability that is uh, superposed on top of the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, this is, is, is manifest in um, weather, weather prediction. So over time, this, this plot is now a few years old, but over um, the last couple of decades, as computers have gotten better and better, and as our ability to measure the initial conditions in the atmosphere gets better and better, we've been able to, through great amount of struggle, push the horizon of predictability for the Earth's weather system um, from time scale of roughly six days in the late 80s um, up to roughly nine days now. Um, what that means is that a weather forecast that goes out nine days from now has a 60% chance of being substantially correct. Um, and you, you, you know this from experience. If you look at the iPhone weather forecast, it gives you 10 days in advance. And 10 days out, you, know, you have about a 60% chance of the high and the low and the particular cloud pattern that it's, it's predicting to be actually correct. And so that window of predictability, which has been pushed out to about um, 10, 9, 10, 11 days, uh, is reflecting the fact that the transport of information around the Earth occurs effectively at the speed of sound. So jetliners travel roughly at the speed of sound. It takes a jetliner that doesn't have to refuel roughly 24 hours to circumnavigate the Earth. And so with each sound crossing time for the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the initial conditions, the errors in the initial conditions, the small changes in the initial conditions that you don't know about have more and more time to build up. And what that does is that makes the horizon of predictability for the Earth's weather system. The ultimate horizon is sitting at something like two or three weeks. No matter how much computer power you have, it's going to be impossible to get accurate weather forecasts that go beyond about two weeks. And we're already getting substantially close to that with the supercomputer efforts and the meteorological efforts that are being made. And so it's interesting to think about that time scale and to think about what the relevant period for transmission of information is. In the context of the solar system, uh, predictability occurs for millions of years because that's the time scale over which planets exchange energy and angular momentum. For the Earth, that predictability Ability is taking place over weeks because that's the time scale. It's a multiple of the time scale, the sound crossing time around the Earth system. And so it's interesting to think of other systems that have both shorter and longer horizons. So I wanted to show an example, an interesting system that involves predictability on very, very short time scales. And so what this is our two maps that are made uh, from Federal Communications uh, Commission data. And the first map shows all of the towers that have been built for radio broadcasts. This is primarily cell towers, but also uh, microwave radio towers. Um, and you can see that you know there's there's 
hundreds of thousands of these towers and they, they sort of map the population distribution of the United States. And then this plot, this map on the right shows new links between towers. And what you see is this interesting sort of straight line on part of the United States and actually a triangle that connects Washington DC with New York and Chicago. And there's nothing analogous in the, in the rest of the United States. If I were to zoom in and we had better bandwidth, you could see that this is a very different structure than anything else in the graph. So it's interesting to, to zoom in to this region in Chicago and see what's going on here. So basically take a sharper look at the data. And when you zoom in, you see that the links are all ending or many of them are ending at this one particular spot. This is satellite view and Fermi lab is literally just across the street here. And so at first glance, this looks like it might have something to do with Fermi lab but it doesn't, it seems to have something to do with this building right here. And you can go into Google Earth and you can look at the actual towers that these links are connecting to and you see that they're uh, microwave dishes that are being put on these towers near this mysterious building. And you can zoom in further to this building and you can see that there is an enormous amount of power going into it and that there's generators on the side here. And then in Google Street View, you can go in and try to look at what the building is, but there's no, there's no signs, there's no indication of what it is. It's like a mysterious thing. Um, here's another picture just like, if you kind of try to see what's going on, it's, it's just the bland interstate sort of highway region. The building is right near Interstate I-88. Um, and so what's going on here, as you've probably guessed, is an effort to um, make better predictions in the same way that uh, a huge amount of supercomputer effort has gone into pushing the prediction horizon for the Earth's weather system from six days to uh, roughly eight days in 2011 to roughly nine or 10 days now, um, a huge effort is going into predicting what will happen to the markets. And the market predictability is something that doesn't work eight days into the future. It's something that works milliseconds into the future. And so uh, what this graph shows is what happens to stocks in New York a few milliseconds after something happens in Chicago. And the, the lines in that, that graph were basically to get the information from Chicago to New York effectively at the speed of light. And then you can see that the response of the, of the stocks is predictable. Um, over time scale ranging out to about 40 milliseconds. And so here we have another example of predictability, but the time scale is drastically shortened. And the reason why the time scale is drastically shortened is because the time scale for information communication has been drastically telescoped. Planets are communicating their information to each other on time scale of millions of years. The weather is communicating through sound waves on a time scale of days to weeks. And the markets are communicating uh, at the speed of light, which on the surface of the earth corresponds to time scales of milliseconds and horizons of predictability that run out to 40 or 50 milliseconds. So I can't tell you what Apple stock is going to do tomorrow, 10 days from now or a year from now. But if I have access to this information, I can tell you what Apple stock will be doing 40 milliseconds from now. So there's this remarkable sort of commonality between the physical structures that we're seeing. And it's just that they unfold over radically different time scales. Um, moving out, sort of zooming out to the problem of the solar system stability, which 
Poincaré demonstrated can never be known with exactness. Um, if we take the analogy of weather prediction, we can ask, we may not know whether the solar system will be stable over time, but what are the odds that it will be stable? What are the chances that uh, Mercury, for instance, will collide with Venus? Or what are the chances that Mars will collide with the Earth? Um, we can't say for sure, but we can evaluate what the odds will be and say, maybe it's 10% chance the solar system is stable over the lifetime of the sun. Maybe it's a 99.99999% chance, maybe um, it's 2%. What's, what's the answer? So this has been um, you know, a very exciting uh, part of, of celestial dynamics, the age of the computers. And this has been going on since the mid eighties. Um, the picture up here, in the left shows a mechanical calculator from the uh, 1800s from the Paris Observatory. And then we now have digital calculators. And so the first really high quality efforts to map, predict the motion of the planets over long periods were made in the 80s. Um, this, this digital orrery was the first to show that the planetary motions in our own solar system are chaotic and was the first to measure this effective time scale of predictability horizon. So in the same way that the weather is predictable over a week or so and the stock market is predictable over 40 milliseconds or so, turns out that that time scale is a quarter millions of years, about 5 million years for the solar system. And so what that's telling us is that we can make tremendously accurate predictions about things like eclipses that go out centuries into the future, but we can't predict eclipses hundreds of thousands of years into the future. And even the most basic items such as the positions of the planets or the shapes of their orbits, uh, even with the absolute best measurement of where the planets are now, we uh, have no idea where there will be in 50 to 100 million years. And what is interesting is, is that if you do large numbers of calculations, what you find is that sometimes in the envelope of possibilities, bad things can happen. Um, and so what, what has been found is that if you take the solar system, and you march it forward in time, and you look at what the planets are doing, and identify moments when the planets are uh, sort of slightly out of sorts, where the eccentricities of the orbits are high. And if you zero into those moments when the eccentricities are high, and then make new copies of the solar system and march those out in time, then you can start to see what the structure of probabilities looks like. And what you see are some sort of alarming things. In this graph right here, this is a uh, graph of Mars's eccentricity. And I apologize for the scientific notation, but what this is saying is just that in this particular calculation, 800 million years from now, Mars is thrown out of the solar system. Um, and the problem um, has now been solved. And it turns out that there is a 99% chance that the uh, solar system will remain stable for the remaining lifetime of the sun. Our sun is scheduled to last about 6 billion more years uh, before it turns seriously into a red giant and seriously threatens the earth and engulfs mercury and does other bad things to the solar system. Um, but there's only a 1% chance that the planets will destabilize before the sun creates problems to the entire solar system. This is a remarkable uh, number. It seems like either it could be a uh, very high chance or no chance at all. The 99% is kind of an interesting geometric uh, median between those extreme possibilities. And what's also doubly remarkable is that if 
you use Newton's laws of gravity, if you go all the way back to the formulation that Newton made, in which gravity is a pure one over R squared force law, then what you find is that the odds of stability go way, way down. So if you solve the problem that Newton thought he was solving, that Laplace thought he was solving, that Poincaré thought he was solving, uh, the answer is that the solar system has a very high chance of destabilizing and its stability depends on the tiny derangement uh, that general relativity provides to the Newtonian force law. So there's a sort of remarkable full circle here in that Newton um, pointed out that the understanding this exceeded the force of any human mind. And indeed, to understand whether planet orbits are stable, one has to know about general relativity. One has to draw in one of the greatest scientific advances of the 20th century. So the um, takeaway from all this is that predictability uh, is a relative thing and it depends on the particular system that you're interested in. So what I wanted to do now in the last uh, little bit of the talk is sort of open the mind up to the very largest uh, 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 scales. So I'm gonna stop my share here and I'm gonna go to a website. Um, so I think you're just seeing me right now while I type in the website name. And uh, so let me go back to my screen share here and share the website. So um, the site that I've gone to is called Metaculus. Can you guys can you guys see that? And Metaculus is all about predictions, and it sort of makes a uh, best effort to fight against this tide of unpredictability that creeps in at every scale. And so a lot of Metaculus's focus is on things that will happen relatively soon. And a lot of the focus is on things that are sort of um, prosaic. So uh, when I just pull up Metaculus, there's uh, some questions that don't seem particularly interesting to a, a big picture astronomy talk. But if I do a search and um, I'll just type in the word universe, then starts to bring up questions that have a much longer uh, time scale. And so let me not, here we go. This one right here. And so this question is sort of the ultimate prediction and it is, will the universe end? So um, I'll end the talk by uh, leaving this up and um, get the discussion started for uh, any questions or ideas that this sort of general ideas about predictability have, have produced. So I'll stop sharing so I can see uh, the people who want to talk. And you won't provide the answer to whether or not the universe will end? Well, I'll provide the current odds. So the current odds, let's go back to sharing the screen. I am providing the answer. The universe is a chaotic system and uh, the odds are 83% that it will end. So you'll have to read the, the, the fine print, but um, there've been 597 um, predictions so far deep thinkers from a wide variety of paths of life. And so the current odds are 83%. There's, there's a number of very interesting deep time questions on Metaculus. Um, one that is particularly interesting to me is uh, whether the eclipse that's scheduled for the year 2522, there's going to be a total eclipse that is predicted to occur in the year 2522. The question is, is whether that will happen or not. And so you might think, oh, of course it's going to happen because we can predict where the 
planets are going to be to very, very high precision. It's obvious that that eclipse is going to happen. Um, but let me just find what the current odds on that are. So let me um, go back and I'll just search for eclipse. And here's the question. So the question is, is will there be a total solar eclipse in 2522? And that's right now running at 96% chance. So I want to think, whoa, wait, what is going on? Why would anybody predict that that eclipse won't occur? Now, of course, if that's how you're thinking, go to Metaculus, sign up for free and put in a 100% prediction. But it's interesting to think about reasons why that eclipse might not occur. And that provides a good, a good segue to um, opening it up for discussion. All right, thank you, Greg. We will give you some, perhaps inaudible, but wild applause at the very end of tonight's presentation. So let's let's get to the questions. I'm seeing a few here in the chat. No raised hands yet, but uh, let's see. Yes, I, <clears throat> oh, I raised oh, my hand. Please. So I, on this last topic, how are these predictions actually calculated? I mean, are this just a count of how many people say what? Uh, there, will the people that make predictions somehow be weighted by their you know, capability of actually making predictions or where yeah. do these numbers come from? Yeah, so, so, so what, we, what we have is, is an algorithm that looks at primarily at track record. So if you go to Metaculus and you're unknown to the site and you make predictions, then it has a flat prior on whether you're a good predictor or not. But then as you make more and more predictions, then your um, track record gets established. And so if you're somebody who is good at predicting on the type of question that you're predicting on, then that's given more weight. And so um, what you were seeing right there was the median community prediction. But what we also have, and you can get on the site, is the prediction that's weighted by track record of the individual Breyer scores of the participants. And so that turns out to be far, far better than simply the median. And so I'll, I'll uh, not disclose what the metaculous prediction is about whether the universe will end and the metaculous prediction of whether that eclipse will occur in 2522, but those are both substantially different than the raw community median, which is what's displayed um, in the view that I was showing. Well, it's just with one of these questions, I think it's not even clearly defined what it means the universe to end. So the, the question itself seems pretty- oh, so, so if you if you read, the, so, so that's, that's a great point. And it's, it's difficult um, to operationalize questions like that. But if you go and read in detail, it's spelled out very clearly uh, what we actually mean by will the universe end. So, so the, um, a lot of care is taken to operationalize these questions in a way that does make them resolve. Now that question won't resolve because you have to wait a very long period of time, but in theory it could. So something more concrete, you mentioned that in one scenario, 800 million years from now, Mars may be thrown out of the system. What is the actual chance for that? I mean, if we look at the best data we have today, is that a 1% oh, chance or what? It's about a 1% chance. Okay, it's thank about you. A 1 chance. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions, Carlo. I see down here that Erica, at, well, maybe Jim, maybe Jim Lawson's question, presumably predictability may have a dependence on inertia, both physical and intellectual. Is that fair to say, Gregory? Uh oh, frozen screen? No, there you are. Yeah, so I think a way to. No, yeah, so that's 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 a good question and a nice way of thinking about it. Um, I think that that could be translated into this fact that some nonlinear differential equations are extremely sensitive to initial conditions, whereas others, for instance, the ones that describe the evolution of the planets are sticky 
and the planets have a type of inertia in that sense. And so the orbits diffuse and decay uh, very, very slowly from their current positions. So I think that, that the nature of unpredictability depends very profoundly on the particular system that's being modeled. So for instance, the stock market is extraordinarily uh, prone to quickly, quickly changing its character. Um, and that's because it is eventually feeding on itself and observing itself and trying to beat itself in, 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 in some sense. Whereas the planetary orbits are unfolding over a vastly longer period of time and retain their essential predictability for much longer time scales, literally millions of orbits. Got it. Thanks, Greg. Erica says, is this unpredictability fundamental? or a result of the finite computing resources. Would you put this in the same class as quantum uncertainty? Yeah, this is fundamental. And uh, ultimately quantum uncertainty defines a limit of ability. And so you make the um, intellectual exercise of moving the center of mass by one Planck length. That's the sort of smallest, smallest distance that you can possibly imagine using an extremely high energy measurement. And so that tiny, that tiny change in the Earth's position, that quantum fluctuation would lead to all of the things being equal, a complete loss of predictability within about 200 million years. So it is, it is absolute and it is uh, fundamental in our universe. Let me insert a question here that is akin, I think, to Erica's. You mentioned that currently our weather prediction abilities drop out at about nine or 10 days. But you said that there's a, an, an absolute, I want to stick this word in there, theoretical limit of, a, I believe you said, three weeks. That beyond three weeks, it's literally impossible, no matter how our computing skills may improve. So that's also that, that's due to the, the quantum uncertainty and where the particles in the atmosphere are. Oh, and, and so. So it's the same. Yes. Yeah, it's the same as the Earth, the Earth, the solar system un unpredictability being limited by you know, some bizarre quantum limit to about 200 million years. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what's pushing the Earth out to roughly three weeks is the compounding of quantum uncertainty. So even if you somehow were able to know where every air molecule was in a kinetic sense, which is in itself requires a computer that's larger than the universe, but if you had access to that, if you had access to the simulation, uh, you would be able to get an exact weather forecast out for about three weeks. But the ejection of Mars from the solar system in what, 400 million years? That doesn't seem to be dependent on a quantum factor, does it? No, no, that's, that, that's one particular realization of a whole bundle of trajectories, right? So that's, that's one member of the 1% where things don't work out. So what you can do is you can compute a particular possible realization of the solar system. Um, and so that's deterministic in the sense that it's a correct evolution of the differential equations, but because you don't know the initial conditions perfectly and that cannot know those initial conditions perfectly, that trajectory is one sample from an infinite bundle of trajectories. And so if you do enough of them, if you do a thousand calculations of the future evolution of the solar system and you see that, oh, about 10 or 11 of these have gone unstable, then that's starting to tell you that the odds are of order 1% if 11 or 10 or nine out of a thousand are leading to the loss of Mars, then you can establish a probability of 1%. And that's how that 1% is known. It's not calculated from some a priori principle. It's calculated by doing lots of simulations of future trajectories, making tiny changes, adjustments to the initial conditions and looking at what that bundle appears to look like. I, oh, I see a raised hand. Stuart, why? Please. Uh... Unmute yourself and ask away. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you, uh, greatly enjoying our uh, 
your, your presentation and our discussion. I did put my uh, question just in the chat and I'll read it. Uh, with regard to our, the trading example that you shared, um, our society may change the such applicable laws to make things fair, to eliminate the technological uh, edge that such companies would have to trading um, using high speed networks, computers and algorithms. Um, uh, and you presented the problem of the stability of our solar system or the whole universe. Um, and on a more concerning level, um, we, we worry about the next uh, asteroid uh, which would hit Earth, uh, such as the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Well, how do our scientists um, make such predictions on which asteroids um, uh, might hit Earth uh, and how accurate are those predictions? And uh, once we decide that uh, we're in imminent danger of a uh, of such a uh, uh, strike of a large enough asteroid, uh, how could we change the laws uh, yeah. to avoid such uh, impact? Thank you. Yeah, those are those are great ideas. So, um, as far as the asteroid risk goes, the most important factor is understanding what the inventory of the solar system is. So, um, Doug Lynn, I guess, is your next speaker in this series, and he's going to talk about Oumuamua. Oumuamua was found by um, the PanStars project, and what PanStars is tasked to do is to find all the small bodies that have orbits that are currently in the near-Earth vicinity. Um, and so something that's very encouraging is, is that there are no asteroids uh, that are known that within our lifetime could um, create you know, something like the KT impact. Um, there's no 10 kilometer or even five kilometer asteroids that are currently endangering the earth. Um, and the detection of bodies has gotten down to things that are a few tens of meters in size, like the Chelyabinsk impactor was not seen, uh, but it very easily could have been tracked and seen before it, before it hit came out of a part of the sky where it, it hadn't, been, hadn't been found. Um, and so if something is found, then what you can do is you would immediately calculate a very large number of possible trajectories. So its orbit and especially its shape and the way that it responds to sunlight wouldn't be perfectly understood. So there would be an envelope of possibilities and you would immediately invest a lot of supercomputer time to calculating that envelope of possibilities. And then once that envelope was understood, if there was a time scale of years, then you uh, can do various things to deflect the asteroid. So it takes only a small change in the asteroid's um, orbit. And I'm talking a very small change to you know, make a difference of a few thousand miles when it arrives at Earth at some point in the future. NASA's running a very interesting mission called the DART mission where it is going to perturb the orbit of a binary asteroid and study how um, a small impact then changes the trajectory of those two orbiting bodies. So we're really sort of at the level of technology and level of understanding where if we get some advanced notice an asteroid deflection is quite possible using using an impactor. And uh, we're also fortunately um, seeing that there's a very small chance that we're in any immediate danger for a sort of civilization affecting impact. But for things like the Chelyabinsk or the Tunguska impactor, we're still at a risk from those and we're categorizing what's out there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Stuart. Greg, let me ask not about asteroids, which seem to be, we rarely learn of new asteroids being discovered, but we do learn of new comets being discovered quite often. Could a comet be of sufficient size and sufficiently inappropriate orbit to do us in? Yeah, the odds, the odds are pretty small, but it is true that a, a new long period comet um, we would pick that up in a sort of a J Jupiter like distance, most likely, if it was a kilometer to across or two across. And it's quite possible that you could have 
one of those come out of the blue and, and, and hit the earth. So we are at risk from that. And <clears throat> a comet coming in is a much more serious issue than an asteroid in the sense that if a comet truly is on a impact trajectory and you would have to get spacecraft together, marshal it and deflect it and you just have one chance to do it. So it's something that we probably could do if we had two years notice, but it would be, uh, it would be risky and it would be, um, <laughs> it would be a close shave. Another possibility that we now know is out there is that something like a Muumuu um, could come from interstellar space and, and possibly impact the Earth. So Muumuu, I believe, came within 60 lunar distances of Earth, which is quite close on the you know, sort of scale of the solar system. It didn't wasn't really a near miss, but it's interesting that it, basically as soon as we had the ability to detect something like a Muumuu, we we found one and it came surprisingly close to the Earth. So we're also at a little risk of cosmic bullets. And so Doug Lynn will talk about that. So that should be a really exciting talk to listen to. Great. Thank you for pausing there to not steal Professor Lynn's thunder in, in four weeks. <laughs>